Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Sam Daly Harris, and I'm the director of the Microcredit Summit campaign. I'm going to start with a little bit of logistics. Number one, uh, the Secretary of State for International Cooperation of Spain, uh, Soraya Rodriguez, <laughs> is going to speak in Spanish. So if you don't have a headset, you might want to go over to the table there and pick one up. Number two, in order to work them, if you'll turn the on-off volume dial at the top to on, number one. And number two, if you'll turn to channel three, uh, then you'll have uh, this operating as you need it uh, to work. And, you know, there'll be translators going on in the room, so you might even hear better uh, if you use this. Uh, there might be, or it might not be channel three for everyone. It might be... Uh, you get it three in, in for, everyone. for everyone. Okay. So if someone's speaking in English, channel three will be Spanish. If someone's speaking in Spanish, channel three will be English. Okay, very good. Then we have um, a special participant who's not at the table. Maybe he's at that table over there, Professor Yunus. And I think we can bring uh, Professor Yunus on the screen now. Uh, I believe. So let me just tell you that we're here to release the State of the Microcredit Summit campaign report. Hello, Professor Yunus. Welcome. Hi, hello. <laughs> okay, very good. Hi, good uh, to see you, Sam. Now, he is good not in a room now. next door. He's actually in Dhaka, Bangladesh. And <laughs> we're going to hear from our speakers in this order. Larry Reed is the author of the report, and we'll hear from Larry first. We'll then hear from Spanish Secretary of State Soraya Rodriguez Ramos. And third, we'll hear from U.S. Ambassador at Large for Global Women's Issues, Milan Verveer. And today is the day before the International Year of Women, the 100th anniversary. So uh, it's a, an important lead in. And then finally, we'll hear from Professor Yunus. And we'll all speak briefly. I'm about to sit down, and we're going to plead that the first question is about the report, and all the others can be addressed to us or Professor Yunus about the situation in Bangladesh and the like. So without further ado, please welcome Larry Reed, who's the author of the State of the Microcredit Summit campaign report, and previously he was uh, uh, the CEO of Opportunity International Network. So please welcome Larry Reed. Thank you, Sam. And uh, Sam, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to write this report. I'd also like to welcome Secretary Rodriguez, Ambassador Verveer, and uh, Professor Yunus, it's great to see you. Uh, you're looking Hi, good over there. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah. In 2006 in Halifax, the Microcredit Summit had a relaunch and set two goals during that relaunch. To uh, work to reach 175 million of the poorest families with microcredit and to see 100 million of those families move from below the poverty line to above it. In this report, we chronicle the results uh, so far in trying to reach those goals. And what the results show are on the first goal, we are well on our way to reaching it. The report shows that the microfinance movement around the world in 2009 reached 128 million of the poorest families. So we're, by 2015, which is when the goal was set for, we are well on our way to the 175 million. The report also says, though, that the second goal of seeing 100 million move out of poverty is as much a challenge as we thought it was when we set it back in 2006. As you know, in the past year, in microfinance, there have been mixed reports. Uh, academic studies show some results in moving out of poverty, but maybe not as much as we expected. In this report, we cover those academic studies, and we look at what are their challenges, what are the strengths and weaknesses of those studies, and also the challenge of having measurements over time, because we know the journey out of poverty is not a 12-month or an 18-month journey, but often it's a five-year journey or a decade-long journey. And so the challenges of measuring movements out of poverty over time is one thing that's covered in the report. We also look at some of the challenges in parts of the world where microfinance has been 
widely distributed, in fact, so widely that sometimes there have been an overabundance of loans in areas like Andhra Pradesh and India. And we look at the IPO of SKS microfinance in India and have four different viewpoints on whether or not that is a good thing for the industry. What we see in looking at this past year at microcredit and microfinance in general is that microfinance is a tool that can be used for great good and cause people to be able to empower themselves and to lift themselves out of pover poverty. But we also see that used indiscriminately, microfinance can also cause harm. And we look at that honestly in this report. And we look at the challenges of finding ways to make sure microfinance is used in those conditions where it can be a tool for good. We highlight the efforts in the industry that are happening now to make sure that happens. One is the SMART campaign, which is a, an effort of the Center for Financial Inclusion and CGAP. And that effort is sort of the do no harm principle for microfinance. These are the basic minimums that anyone offering financial services to the poor should abide by to make sure people are not harmed. We also look at the social protection, uh, social performance task force and the standards that they're setting for those involved in microfinance for social reasons that want to achieve social good and they are setting standards for that. And then we call for a third level of recognition in this industry, a seal of excellence for poverty alleviation and transformation. We, we, in our goals, want to be able to highlight those who are focusing on moving people out of poverty and are seeing results in getting that to happen because those who achieve that are doing the hardest work in this field. And we need a way of recognizing them and learning from them. The report starts with the stories of two women. One is Rita in Ghana, who through access to credit, but not just credit, also access to saving services, to a group that would support her, and to more knowledge about planting and harvesting and crop rotation, she was able to resuscitate her cocoa farm and earn enough money to send her children to school and to dream of a better life for her children. We also tell the story of Zahira in Andhra Pradesh, India, for whom microcredit became a curse. She had not just one loan, but eight, and her meager income could not pay the repayments on all eight loans. And so access to credit resulted in misery for herself and her family. And for us, that is a tragedy, and that is a tragedy that should not happen in microfinance. And that is the reason we are calling for this seal of excellence to be able to highlight those who take on the task of poverty alleviation and to be able to learn and to establish best practices around moving people out of poverty with microfinance combined with other needed services. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Uh, please welcome uh, Spanish Secretary of State for International Cooperation, Soraya Rodriguez Ramos. Buenos días. Buenos días, profesor Yunus. Eh, me siento sumamente complacida de estar presente en la presentación del informe del estado de la campaña de la Cumbre de Microcréditos 2011. A mi deseo de estar eh, junto al director de la campaña, el estimado amigo Sam Daly, y eh, con eh, otras personalidades, con Larry, con eh, Melanie, se unía el interés y la intención de estar hoy acompañando al profesor Yunus, eh, que lamentablemente no puede estar eh, con nosotros aquí en Washington, pero desde luego contamos con su presencia. Al profesor Yunus le consideramos no solamente un amigo, sino un promotor indiscutible y admirable en la causa universal de la lucha contra la pobreza, al que mi país, España, como saben, le distinguieron en 1998 como con una de sus más altas condecoraciones, el Premio Príncipe de Asturias de la Concordia. Este premio eh, quiso significar un apoyo decidido al esfuerzo del profesor Yunus de varias décadas para organizar con enorme creatividad un sistema financiero adaptado a las personas más desfavorecidas del planeta, 
un sistema que se ha mostrado eficiente para sacar de la pobreza a millones de personas, especialmente a mujeres, y que tiene su expresión más emblemática en el Grimming Bank y hoy en día en varias miles también de instituciones similares que se han ido instalando en el mundo. Confiamos eh, por todo esto que se pueda mantener eh, la autonomía del Grimming Bank, que desde luego es un símbolo del esfuerzo para eh, expresar a toda la ciudadanía que los pobres tienen oportunidades y que estas oportunidades que se dan a los más pobres pueden ayudarles a transformar sus vidas. Y además eh, el Grimming Bank como símbolo y el profesor Yunus son un estímulo permanente para que los responsables de las políticas de desarrollo y la comunidad internacional de donantes hagamos esfuerzos imaginativos y busquemos mecanismos de innovación en la lucha contra la pobreza, contra una pobreza que cada vez atrapa a más y más personas. Eh, el informe que hoy se presenta confirma que la experiencia de los microcréditos y en la utilización de las microfinanzas como instrumento de desarrollo se va instalando en más y más países y se va instalando cada vez más en las agendas de desarrollo como una actuación prioritaria. Somos conscientes de que queda mucho por avanzar, que tenemos que seguir trabajando sobre todo en, mas, en materia de gestión y medición de la eficacia del sistema de microcréditos en el mundo y uno de los objetivos en los que estamos trabajando para la próxima cumbre es poder establecer un sello de excelencia, un sello de garantía que nos sirva para certificar las mejores prácticas en este campo, que no solo mida eh, la viabilidad y el éxito económico y financiero de los microcréditos, sino que al, en, al, al mismo tiempo considere los impactos sociales, la lucha contra la pobreza y la marginalidad que se consiguen con ellos. Quiero señalar que España es eh, un país muy comprometido con los programas de microfinanzas. Somos eh, el segundo país en el ámbito bil bilateral que más utiliza este instrumento. Más de 750 millones de euros en cartera en 10 años de trabajo con microcréditos y eh, más de 2 millones y medio de clientes. Este compromiso tan importante de, nuestro, de España con los microcréditos nos hizo pedir y solicitar poder albergar la, siguiente, la próxima cumbre, la quinta cumbre mundial de microcréditos. Es para nosotros un verdadero honor y una satisfacción poder albergar esta cumbre el próximo noviembre de 2011 en España, en Valladolid. Una ciudad eh, que desde luego eh, va a acoger eh, de la mejor forma que, 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 que pueda a los más de 2.000 delegados que van a ir a esta, a esta cumbre. Estamos también absolutamente convencidos que en eh, noviembre del 2011 vamos a, a contar desde luego en Valladolid con eh, el profesor Yunus y que le vamos a recibir eh, en España como lo hemos hecho siempre, con mucho respeto y con mucho cariño. Y desde luego estamos convencidos que este respeto eh, es, eh, es, va a ser compartido por toda la comunidad internacional allí presente, eh, en un significando, mostrando el apoyo universal que en estos momentos difíciles está recibiendo el profesor Yunus, a quien desde aquí hoy, Quiero animar a no desfallecer en su lucha por acercar la esperanza a miles y miles de personas pobres, a millones de familias que buscando una oportunidad en el ámbito de las microfinanzas están trasladando una esperanza y una oportunidad diferente, de vida diferente a sus hijos. En definitiva, les están explicando, les están acercando, les están diciendo que ellos también en sus distintos países, tienen un futuro. Muchas gracias.
If there are any press that are outside, please feel free to come up uh, along the wall here. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce U.S. Ambassador at Large for Global Women's Issues, Milan Verveer. Thank you, Sam, and good morning. I'm so pleased to be here for the release of the State of Microcredit Summit campaign and to be here with so many people committed to microfinance and the important role that it plays in poverty alleviation. I think it's fitting that this release take place on the eve of the 100th anniversary of the International Women's Day because microcredit has effectively lifted up millions and millions of women and their families out of poverty. The report shows that 81% of the recipients of microloans, 100 million borrowers, were women. And over the years, we have seen that women are a smart investment. They consistently have demonstrated a high loan repayment rate, and they invest their income in their families and communities. I am especially happy to be here this morning, although via the medium of technology, with my dear friend, Professor Yunus. I first met Dr. Yunus more than 15 years ago when I was Chief of Staff to then First Lady Hillary Clinton. She had known him for many years earlier because he had come to Arkansas to advise then Governor Clinton on ways microcredit combined with self-help could lift up the lives of the poor living in the Arkansas Delta region. So microcredit is truly a tool without borders that has done enormous good. In 1995, for the first time, I visited the Grameen villages with Mrs. Clinton. And as he is attired today in his Grameen print, he was then. To see firsthand what the poorest people, the poorest women, were doing with the loans that they paid back on time, with the training that they received, with the life practices that they agreed to adopt in terms of hygiene and education of their children, was to see the transformation of lives. I remember talking with a woman that day who had described how with her first loan she bought a milk cow and her family's income had made a dramatic turn in an improved way. She paid back her loan, she got another milk cow. Things were going very well. Paid back that loan, saw a business beginning to prosper in ways she never imagined and took out another loan. She said this time it would be for a rickshaw to put her husband to work. When I returned to Bangladesh some months ago, I met with another group of Grameen women who told me in great detail again about the businesses they had and the improvements in their lives. So Dr. Yunus and the leadership of Grameen that he has provided over so many years is seen as a beacon of hope for all who care about human progress, both in Bangladesh and around the world. And here in the United States, the Medal of Freedom was awarded to him by President Obama, and the Congressional Gold Medal, which the U.S. Congress voted in 2010 to award him, represent the respect we have for him and his work, and the recognition that he has been a global trailblazer because he has never forgotten the basic mission of Grameen, to help the poor. Today, financial services for the poor have evolved to include savings and insurance. And the international community is not only focused on providing the poor with access to capital, but it is also focused on a holistic approach to micro-enterprise development to enable the poor to develop their own businesses and to become economically independent. And increasingly, foundations like the Gates Foundation recognize the importance of microfinance for development. 
Just a few months ago, they announced a $500 million investment to promote savings over the next five years. Financial inclusion is a top priority for the United States government. In addition to being a topic of discussion at the G20, microfinance for poverty reduction and economic empowerment is a significant investment in our development work. USAID supports a range of microenterprise programs from Afghanistan to the DRC from Bosnia to Kyrgyzstan, and I have seen so many firsthand in so many places around the world. Secretary Clinton has been a longtime champion of microfinance as an effective development tool and powerful social innovation, and continues leadership on this issue today. In 1997, as First Lady, she delivered the keynote address at the Microcredit Summit that launched the campaign whose 2011 report is being released today. Ritu's story, as was mentioned, that is showcased in the report, is one that is the story of microfinance when it works well. She was able to both get a small loan and to get the training to diversify her crops so she had money coming in year round when previously she had been almost destitute during those months when she wasn't benefiting from her crops. And with a steady income, she was now able to save money. And she said the biggest thing for her was to start to save. And as she said, now I have savings to tap for school fees for my children and for other needs. In the report's discussion of the importance of savings, we can see Rita's experience. Today, there are exciting developments with enormous potential, like M-Pesa in Kenya, that provides access to financial services to the poor through mobile banking. We need a greater focus on financial inclusion, as the report points out. Microfinance alone is not enough. It is critical when tied to insurance to protect the poor from catastrophes that can wipe away their economic progress overnight and other types of services. Then it can be much more effective in reducing poverty. I hope it will be increasingly possible for microfinance to be a growing incubator of SMEs where jobs creation take place on a greater level. For women, this is especially true because they can be excellent accelerators of economic growth if they can overcome the barriers that keep them from starting small businesses or expanding existing businesses. We applaud the clarity of the report, the forthright discussion of the challenges facing microcredit that were pointed out, particularly the challenge of rapid growth, which has led to sometime abusive practices, a breakdown of lending discipline, a loss of focus on the fundamental poverty reduction mission on the part of a few. The seal of excellence that was mentioned is certainly a step in the right direction. We should remember that today, as we celebrate the launch of this report, three billion people in the world remain unbanked. The majority of them are women. So there is continued work to do to close the gap. But yet, at the same time, as women around the world celebrate International Women's Day, many of them, especially the millions at the bottom of the pyramid, who today are economically empowered and their families have a better future because of microfinance, indeed have something to celebrate. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I want to just say one thing in introducing Professor Yunus, uh, and that is uh, I have a daughter, Sophie, who's nine, and a son, Micah, who's 12. And we, the three of us, have talked about the situation in Bangladesh over the last several weeks and, and more. And I talked to them about visionaries. 
and how sometimes visionaries are harassed by their governments and how Nelson Mandela was a visionary and harassed by his government and Mahatma Gandhi was a visionary and harassed by his government and Martin Luther King was a visionary harassed by his government and that that's what's going on right now in Bangladesh and when I tell that to my nine-year-old and my 12-year-old they really get it so it's a real honor to introduce a visionary and I won't add the harass part right now uh, and ask him to offer a few remarks then we'll open it up to one question on the report and then any others to Professor Yunus after that Thank you, Sam. I'm, I'm delighted uh, that at least I could see you on the screen and uh, I'll be w I'm with you. Actually, I uh, started for airport yesterday to come to your uh, uh, conference today, uh, but I had to stop uh, getting into the plane because things were going uh, in the wrong direction in Bangladesh, so I had to stay uh, in Bangladesh. So that's why I'm here and I'm uh, lucky that it at least can participate uh, to the benefit of the technology. Uh, Sam, you just said that uh, visionaries have to uh, suffer uh, uh, from their governments, so you are kind of uh, encouraging me to suffer. That's not a very pleasant experience, I can tell you that. Uh, I would rather be with you and uh, talk about the things that we need to do uh, from now on and all the exciting th things that are coming up. Uh, and uh, Milan, Ambassador Milan, that's a, a, such a good friend, uh, she has been all along with us uh, during this crisis and supporting us all, all, all the way. Uh, thank you, Milan, for uh, being with us. Uh, and uh, Secretary uh, Soraya, thank you very much for uh, coming all the way from Madrid to participate in this conference. And uh, Her Majesty Queen Sofia has called me up uh, to encourage me to um, have strength and uh, also uh, talk about the terrible things that are happening with me. So today uh, I'll be talking about a uh, few words about the Microcredit Summit uh, report. Uh, this is about 13 years now since we began 1997 with the Microcredit Summit. Uh, nearly 3,000 delegates. It's such an exciting occasion on that uh, particular day. And uh, we, uh, throughout the whole world, there's a total number of microcredit borrowers at that time. It's the same as the uh, microcredit borrowers today in Bangladesh within Grameen Bank. So that's about the size of the global microcredit summit outreach. Uh, so today Grameen Bank has 8.3 million borrowers. Uh, at that time, uh, the whole world didn't have anything uh, like that, just about uh, closer, to the, closer to that. Uh, so from there, we are now talking about 175 million. By uh, 2015, we have reached 100 million in by 2006. So this is uh, the outreach part of it. And today we have come a long way. We are talking about many more new things and many more things are possible. It's a very strong structure of uh, microcredit throughout the world. Uh, and the first thing that I see uh, is a very important aspect that we ourselves introduced uh, and following it up in Grameen Bank, the second generation second generation of young people who are growing up within the Grameen families. We wanted to make them very different kind of generation, the boys and the girls, looking at the world in a different way, unlike their parents who grew up in absolute uh, bottled up uh, life. They have no life uh, except within the uh, territory of their own home uh, and no future. But these young people who are growing up with the second generation in these families, they have lots of opening. Uh, they know they can change their life uh, the way their mother have done, uh, they, the way they uh, see around things happening. They have access to finances through Grameen Bank uh, and they can do create their own life. So how to make sure the second generation uh, get out of poverty as far as they can get through education, through technology, through healthcare, and many other issues. So this is a new challenge and this is what we are trying to un unveil uh, uh, and uh, roll up the second generation issues. So this is number one. We are ready for that and I'm sure throughout the world people will be looking at the second generation issues, how we address them, what kind of financing is needed and all that. And the other one is about the uh, uh, question of uh, 
uh, health care. This is another issue that we can provide health insurances and so on. So we can do that. We started with the savings. The main bank is also uh, a savings program. Many people don't pay attention to our savings program, but we feel that is the uh, most important part of microcredit uh, in Grameen Bank. Uh, we started uh, emphasizing that savings part right from the very beginning, in back in 1976. Uh, today, the personal savings of borrowers have grown over years. Uh, we lend out uh, over one and a half billion dollar uh, a year, and out of that. Uh, half the money is from the deposits of the Grameen Bank borrowers. So Grameen Bank borrowers maintain and continue to grow uh, with a savings program which is uh, three quarter of a billion dollar. So it's a no joke. There are many branches within Grameen Bank, uh, more than uh, 1,100 branches out of a total of 2,500 branches. With the amount of savings in these uh, branches, the borrowers have 75% uh, and above of their loan amount. So whatever their loan is, uh, more than 75% of that money is already uh, in their bank account. Uh, so you can imagine many of them are way above their uh, uh, loan amount itself. Uh, the amount that they borrow uh, is less than the amount they have saved in the bank. So this creates a completely new dimension. In many cases, borrowers of Grameen Bank are actually the lenders to Grameen Bank. They are the net lender rather than the net borrower. So savings are taking it a completely different shape, different size. Then we are talking about uh, uh, food security because this is becoming a big issue as we go around. So microcredit will become more and more important because of this uh, particular idea, a uh, particular area uh, of crisis that is uh, coming up. Bangladesh is sure to uh, face a food crisis over time because the population is growing, land is squeezing, and the land quality is declining, and the global uh, impact uh, on environmental uh, issues. Uh, environmentally, uh, we are on the fr uh, front uh, line of environmental degradation, all the bad things will happen to a nation. We are the one. So food crisis is becoming a, will become a major, major issue in, in the coming years. So we can get ready uh, with that, how to address the, those issues. So we, as we see the microcredit not only have been doing all the things that we have done over years, but the new areas that are emerging, environment, uh, food crisis, new generation, technology, and all these things can come very, very uh, forcefully, and I'm very happy that we are going to meet in Bayadolid in November uh, this year for our fourth global summit, and we are all excited about it. And particularly on this day, when on the eve of the 100th uh, anniversary of the International Women's Day, uh, because microcredit all said and done, it is the women empowerment uh, tool. Uh, it has made so much impact in Bangladesh in terms of w empowerment of women. Uh, we can see it. We can see the result of it in, a, in, a, in that entirely uh, throughout the world, throughout the country. Uh, what impact this has made uh, in terms of uh, women coming out of their uh, uh, kind of uh, locked up positions in the society and release themselves to contribute their talent, contribute their creativity, to create a world for themselves, for their children, for their family, uh, and own a whole bank for themselves. I mean, bank is owned by them. So it's a bank owned by poor women. So this is where we are. And that's the last point. I will just uh, add a little bit and I'll stop. Uh, that last point that this is a bank owned by poor women. And that's where now under threat because uh, our government somehow feels that they, they would do it in another way. They would like to take the control of the bank uh, by uh, getting into the bank and trying to uh, get me to step down in, uh, in a very abrasive way uh, by notifying that I'm uh, legally uh, not uh, CEO of the bank because something technical thing happened, which is not true. Uh, that for the last 10 years I've been unlawfully occupying my position. So that is the tension. They want to put their own people uh, in the bank and uh, they already uh, have someone uh, as a chair of the chairman of the board, uh, a politically, political person. And we always try to keep the politics out of the organization because if you bring the politics, particular, particularly the politics of the kind that is practiced in countries like Bangladesh, uh, which is a completely different kind than we would like to see within a financial institution. So this is a, now a big tension 
uh, that's going on. So this is where we are. We hope we can survive that uh, and we can keep the character of the bank and keep the independence of the bank so that it remains a bank owned by the poor women, owned by the, uh, for, uh, working for their benefit, working for their next generation and beyond and become stronger and stronger as a self-reliant organization. And this is uh, in the, in the, on the eve of the 100th anniversary of International Women's Day. I think that's a big, big message for all of us. We kept it for the poor women. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to take questions from journalists. We're going to ask that the first question be on the report, and then all the others can be on some other topics on your mind. So if there's a journalist who would like to begin, let us know if you're addressing it to one particular person or the whole panel. Do we have a, a first question? We'll wait. It's fine. Let's see. Go ahead, and then we'll go to the other. Hi, I'm Laurel Ben with Voice of America. Um, in a nutshell, what would you say is the importance of the report? Well, Larry, you want to take it? Uh, he wrote it. I read it four times. <laughs> Only four, Sam? In a nutshell, the, the importance is we are reaching 128 million of the poorest families of the world. Uh, that means you know, you take five family members, that's 640 million or, or more that we're reaching. Uh, that's the size, the population of, uh, of Europe. Uh, more than Europe that we're reaching. Um, but secondly, that there's a lot of work to do to make sure that microfinance maintains itself as a poverty alleviation tool and grows in its ability to alleviate poverty. And so therefore, we need to highlight those organizations that are doing the best at moving people out of poverty, learning from them, learning how to combine microfinance with other efforts like healthcare, like education, like marketing, like small and medium business, in such a way that we can see in, in microfinance institutions movement out of poverty by their clients. Because microfinance helps generate business activity in poor communities. It helps create a pie that's getting bigger and therefore people can use the increased income to invest in their children's education, to invest in better housing, to invest in better services. So as long as we're making decisions about making sure that clients are able to use these services in a way that generates more income or helps them lose less income in hard times, then, then this is something that can be combined with other things to bring about great benefit to communities. And if I could just add to that, imagine uh, the poorest of the poor who would ordinarily not have any access uh, to the, the tools that microfinance represent, and yet through the development of these tools are able uh, to improve their lives in ways that would otherwise not have been possible and certainly in ways they could not have imagined. Great. Who would like to go next? You name a news organization? Go ahead. This is Tejinder Singh from India Today Group. And the question is uh, addressed to uh, Professor Yunus. Uh, it's about uh, what happened in the last uh, 10 years. How did you keep the uh, political uh, elements out? And what exactly uh, you are following now to do the same? Well, for the last 10 years, uh, <clears throat> we had uh, kind of uh, uh, distances from each other. Uh, uh, we had battles, but not in the sense that uh, they will take over the bank. Uh, they, uh, luckily, we had uh, uh, always board members in the Grameen Bank board representing government, very decent people. They acted as an independent person, not as an agent of a political party or something like that. So we had no uh, real uh, connection between the uh, politics uh, of the country and the bank within. So they, they are very highly admired people who were chosen 
to represent in the board of Grameen Bank. There are three representatives of the government sitting in the board, including the chairman of the board. They are all government representatives. But once they are in the government, they, uh, once they are in the board, they acted on their own decision rather than being instructed by somebody from somewhere. Uh, but now suddenly that has changed. They want to. They, be, they became interested. The present uh, government became interested in uh, Grameen Bank as a w way of uh, getting more involved. They have been saying that this is a government institution, and some of the government officials said is an organ of the state uh, because it's a statutory body. They came up with all kinds of um, un uh, unexplainable. Uh, definition of uh, Grameen Bank. Uh, we are talking that yes, they are, this is done by a framing of a law by the government, by an ordinance, but it has its own structure, it's a self-reliant, it's owned by the poor people, 75% of the shares are owned by the poor people, poor women, and 25% is owned by the government. And whatever decision has to be taken, is taken by the board, it's an autonomous in that direction. It's not run by government bureaucracy or something like that. But the government want, today wants to make it part of the government thing so that they can control it totally. So they are looking for, uh, already they put the chairman as their own person who will take instructions from them and looking for replacing me to put somebody, their own person who will take instructions from me, uh, from them so that they, it becomes fully uh, at, their, at their disposal. And I'm sure they see a lot of political advantage in doing that. Uh, so we are trying to resist it because it's owned by the poor people. Uh, the government is only a minor shareholder and everything within the bank is designed by the legal structure that we have rather than uh, political pressure from, uh, from the government. Go ahead. You said that the government is uh, taking over because of some political uh, motives. Uh, will you like to comment on the statement that Grameen Bank is being uh, taken over because they want to make it a vote bank? Uh, no matter what I said, they will deny, deny it because they said that these are all legal issues. Uh, he is illegal and we are trying to remove him because he is illegal. Uh, so the central bank has issued uh, an order that he must quit his position, he is relieved from his responsibility because he has been illegal for the last 12 years or something like that. So they will tell them. But it's a, it's a kind of interpretation that uh, you'll see in the press, uh, local press, international press, how they are interpreting it, what is their intention. Is it me or it's a bank or whatever it is. Give your name and news organization. Uh, go ahead, over there. Uh, William Kim from VOA Korean Service. I have a question to Professor Yunus about North Korea. Um, you know, 128 million is a remarkable number, but unfortunately I can't see any single North Korean in this number. So um, four years ago when you visited Seoul, South Korea, you mentioned about the uh, North Korea and you want to help North Korea with this system. But have you ever contact with North Korean government? And what do you think about this chronic you know, poor situation in North Korea? Thanks. Uh, nobody has contacted us. We have many, many visitors coming from South Korea all the time. We have many programs uh, running in South Korea and uh, 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 lots of South Korean uh, uh, NGOs uh, came to us to uh, learn about our work and copy them in their own uh, world. But uh, none so far from uh, uh, North Korea. So we never uh, had established a relationship with them. But definitely, North Korea would be one country who they can use microcredit very well. Uh, we have been doing it in China for many years. Now we are invited by the Chinese government to do it in, uh, uh, with our own effort, with our own staff, with our own uh, uh, structure and company, uh, one in uh, Inner Mongolia. Uh, so we have created a company, a Grameen company in, uh, in uh, uh, Inner Mongolia, another one in Sichuan. So we have been in these areas uh, in several other areas of China, but unfortunately uh, we have never been to North Korea yet. Pedro Rodriguez, Diario ABC Spain. Uh, in your current situation, uh, what do you expect from the international community, Professor Yunus? 
to uh, support uh, independent space uh, for civil society so that they can peacefully work within that space. Uh, political uh, uh, government doesn't interfere with that space, doesn't squeeze it out. Uh, because it's very important for uh, changing the society because lots of creativity in the civil society. That uh, capacity of uh, pluralistic uh, approaches to uh, create a, a new structure of the society is extremely important to bring the creativity. So um, international community can uh, uh, exert their influence, uh, their access to our, our government to explain the importance of keeping that uh, space uh, uninterrupted. Uh, because whatever has been achieved in Bangladesh, I think it's uh, uh, a big part of it uh, is uh, through the initiative of uh, organizations uh, created by civil societies, uh, activists. And Grameen is one example of it. And Brak is another example of it. And there are many, many such examples within Bangladesh. And Bangladesh has uh, uh, achieved enormous successes in many areas, including poverty reduction, uh, child mortality, and many other things, and particularly in healthcare uh, and income generation and so on. Uh, so I would say uh, international community uh, can pay a lot of attention in uh, interacting with our government to uh, encourage them to protect that space, not to uh, overstep uh, and uh, squeeze this uh, space uh, rather than expand that space. The more expansion of that space will take place, I think the more rapid the creativity will come in, more encouragement will happen. And particularly it's useful for young people to see that they can do change the world of their own, their own efforts. They don't have to wait for the government to come and do everything for them. And also for women, because they are the ones who are neglected, but they have the, all the creativity like anybody else has. Uh, they can bring their creativity and change their own world. So this is what we would like uh, for, we we'll look forward to it, international community through the multilateral organizations, through bilateral relationship, by exchange of university uh, personnel and so on and so forth. Uh, any interaction that we have between countries, I think will be useful to do that. L let me add this before we go to the next question. I think another thing that's at stake is shutting down of one of the most um, innovative laboratories on addressing poverty in the world. So we can talk about first microloans in Bangladesh 35 years ago. That's a true history. But the whole issue of partnerships with Grameen Phone and Village Phone Ladies or Danone and Grameen Danone and yogurt in the villages or Adidas and shoes for a under a dollar fifty for those who can't afford shoes and partnerships with BASF and mosquito uh, bed net treatments and and on and on and on. It's that laboratory that's at stake and many other things are at stake. Autonomy of Grameen, of course, urgent, but there's this whole other laboratory that is if the government gets away, it's sh shutting down. And so, who's next, please? One second. Matthew Pennington from the Associated Press. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Yunus, you, you mentioned in your opening remarks that um, you were on your way to the airport when um, something happened and you, um, you turned back. Could you just um, uh, explain a little bit about what happened at prompted you to, to turn back. And also I'd like to ask, do you, do you see um, what's happening um, as, um, because the government sees you personally as a, a political rival? Well, uh, first let me address the uh, airport thing. Uh, we, I received an order from the uh, central bank saying that uh, your position uh, is uh, the position that you're occupying, you're occupying it uh, unlawfully uh, because of some explanation that the Grameen Bank never took permission uh, from the central bank uh, for your appointment, uh, which is uh, 12 years ago. Uh, now uh, they are saying that uh, because you didn't take it, so you are unlawful since then. Uh, so the uh, question is, if I'm unlawful for 12 years, uh, why suddenly you issue an order without even giving me 12 days notice. So you're instantaneously, you're out of your office. So we, we went to the court 
to say that their order is illegal. So we are in a uh, legal battle. So we thought uh, this, uh, we will get a stay order from the High Court, uh, but this stay order went on and on, uh, uh, going on uh, hearings. And we, it, I thought uh, yesterday in the morning that they will give the verdict and give the stay order and I'll be free to move. So I'll go to the airport and uh, take the plane and go there. But the court decided not to conclude and continue for the next day. So I had to stay today. And today also it went on and didn't finish it yet. So it will we'll go on. Usually it takes only 15 minutes. All it says in a writ petition, uh, OK, uh, we give you a stay order. You go ahead, continue your, with your work. In the meantime, we'll examine all the legal issues in elaboration. That's all it needs. But this court didn't do it that way. So it goes on and on and on. So this is the reason that I couldn't leave the country. So I had to stay on because the court case is continuing. Whether uh, government or uh, the uh, political party can considers me as rival is a speculation. People can say that uh, uh, in one explanation because people are completely puzzled. Why government should do things like that? Uh, it doesn't make sense. So they say maybe they see you as a political rival. I'm not a politician. I'm not in politics. I don't think anybody will take me seriously in politics. Uh, I do things uh, other way. I'm, I'm seen as a businessman. Some people say, ah, this guy is a businessman. Uh, that's OK. Uh, I do business. I mean, bank is a business. I run a business. I'm a CEO of that business. Uh, but not a business for my own benefit or my own uh, profit making. I'm a salary holding uh, executive. I don't own a share, a single share of any company that I ever created. This is my principle. Because all, every company I did, I wanted to do it uh, for solving a specific problem. And I call them social business. So that way, it's fine within that uh, particular area of my work. But not certainly, I never appeared as a, as a, as a uh, politician. So this is a speculation. People may think that uh, I'm a, uh, they are against me because they think I'm a possible threat. This is their speculation, not mine. Please. K.P. Nair from the Telegraph of uh, Calcutta. Uh, as a follow-up to the previous question, are there any restrictions on uh, your travel abroad? And do you fear that once no. you go out, you may not be allowed to come back into the country? No. no uh, both negative. But uh, some rumors go around that uh, um, they will go into not only Grameen Bank, but also all other companies that I have created. Uh, they will go one after another, so so that uh, all these things are uh, squeezed. Uh, they squeeze me out of all this, everything that I do. Uh, so that's the kind of fear everybody feels very nervous because in their statements they always refer to other companies, uh, and their one easy explanation for them, they say you have used all the the money from Grameen Bank, uh, taken uh, diverted uh, secretly to create all these uh, companies. Uh, uh, as if I'm hiding it because I'm personally uh, benefiting from all these companies, which was never the intention. I created every company as an independent company. Uh, my fund sources and everything are independent. It has nothing to do with Grameen Bank. So I explained them a thousand times, but still uh, they have a, a sort of an investigation committee. They call it review committee to make it sound polite. Uh, but actually, they are going into every single piece of paper, every single um, uh, thing that we have, uh, our transactions with the, uh, other companies, whether we have any transactions from in bank versus other companies and so on. So they're uh, quite tough right now uh, in the sense that uh, they want to really uh, go through everything. So, and uh, we'll take one more, for perhaps from someone who's not asked first, and, let's, and then we'll go to you. If Okay, last question. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Did you have a question? Please go ahead. Sorry. Um, Mira Lewis from Bloomberg News. Um, do you anticipate that um, other governments would ca kind of intervene in the situation or any other institutional bodies might intervene? To You're asking me? Yes. Yeah, uh, well, I hope not. I mean, this is not a very pleasant thing to do and it doesn't make sense. Uh, it doesn't make sense in Bangladesh, it doesn't make sense anywhere in the world. Uh, government should not be interfering in a, a way to 
do negative things to initiatives taken by the people, uh, have been doing it for many, many years, and particularly to an organization like Grameen Bank, which has owned Nobel Peace Prize. I mean, this is not just an ordinary organization. Uh, the, 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 no bank in the world has ever received a Nobel Peace Prize, but this bank has. A, a bank, not me. Uh, this is a Nobel laureate bank. Uh, so uh, this, this, this uh, kind of boggles everybody's mind. Why should you do that? Uh, and uh, we are very transparent. We bring out all the information very regularly. We, uh, it's, it's open book for everybody. And it's a bank owned by the poor people. So it's not some greedy guy owning this company, makes lots of money and something like that. And then on top of it, government is a part owner of this company. 25% of the share is with the government. And government sits in the board. And the chairman is representative of the government, plus two other very high officials who are in the government. So whatever government bank has done, a responsibility falls squarely on the shoulders of the government too. Uh, so it's not that secretly we are doing things without uh, letting government know about it. So this will not explain a, a kind of common situation anywhere in the world. So this is uh, quite absurd, the way it's uh, totally unreal, the kind of thing that happens in Bangladesh, in particular case of Grameen Bank. Let me uh, close with a few quick thank yous. Thank you to Professor Yunus for making it to this thank news you. conference this thank way you. and to our panel. Thank you so much for joining us at this news conference. The technology team in Bangladesh and, and here at the Press Club up testing this at 7 this morning. Thank you. And I really want to thank our team, the microcredit summit team. They're mostly, I, I think, out in the back. But if you'll just wave your hand for a moment, thanks for all that you've done to make this work. And I really want to thank the City Foundation, who really uh, allowed us to put this report together and we're grateful there for their support in this effort so uh, thank you all very much thank you